Major production funding provided by Anne Ray Foundation, a Margaret A. Cargill philanthropy. Engagement funding provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and Anne Ray Foundation, a Margaret A. Cargill philanthropy. And by... Support for LPB comes from Community Coffee Company and the Community Cash for Schools program, helping schools across the state earn funds for over 25 years. Registration information at communitycoffee.com. Support provided by the men and women of the Louisiana Forestry Association. For sustainability, LFA members work to promote the health and productivity of Louisiana's forests for generations to come. And by LSU Press, featuring Margaret Stone's Native Flora of Louisiana Folio, limited edition, and these fine titles. Information at lsupress.org. And by these independent booksellers of Louisiana with the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and viewers like you. Hello and welcome to a special edition of Louisiana Public Square. I'm Beth Courtney, president of LPB. We've gathered on the campus of the Baton Rouge Community College to explore the power of reading. I'm joined by Robin Merrick, Vice President of External Affairs for Southern University. Beth, thanks so much for having me. Well, this month, students of all ages are returning to Louisiana's classrooms. Essential to their academic success will be their ability to read. And whether they are working towards a high school diploma or secondary degree, their competency in reading, writing, and math will determine their economic success. Well, as a public media station, LPB is particularly sensitive to the issue of literacy. Preschoolers who view our educational programming exhibit significantly higher literacy skills than their peers. And public broadcasting series like the upcoming The Great American Read encourage viewers to delve into the country's 100 most beloved books. Over the next hour, we'll hear from people who use their positions to help Louisiana's residents become more literate on a daily basis. But before we meet them, let's take a look at some of those efforts. Our street is where we like to be, and it looks like all our dreams. A love of reading often starts with family. Ashley Dido and her son Jordan take part in a Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities program called Primetime. We do more reading at home and we're more focused reading with each other. Now that I'm part of the program, I think I'm reading more fluently, more than I was before. According to Reagan White, the primetime program coordinator, a love of reading takes practice, and with it comes confidence. Since I've been implementing primetime, um, the kids are really interested in reading. They are, you know, really excited to see what's the next book and the next topic and theme of the books that we're going to be reading. Um, so they are really excited. Unfortunately, many Louisiana residents do not develop that love of reading or literacy skills well into adulthood. Gary Robertson is the executive director of Adult Literacy Advocates, which helps adults learn to read. He says statistics show 20% of Louisianians are not literate. One of the big issues for adult learners and adult students is just to have the courage to come in and do it. Um, at a client in last week who's 64, I was the fifth person who knows that he's unable to read. He's been able to to cover it up for all this time. He said his, his spouse knows, and uh, I think a couple of his children know. What literacy means has evolved over time. Before the Civil War, you were considered literate if you could write your own name. By World War II, it's if you were reading at about an eighth grade level. As we moved into more recent years, it's become measured more in terms of whether you have the necessary skills in reading and writing and computation to function in society for your employment and your family's needs. Robertson says those skills aren't developed as a child or young adult for many reasons. There are those who will tell you, yeah, it was just a dumb move to drop out of school when I did, or I followed the crowd, but then you have the others who will tell you that 
they had a learning disability and they didn't get the help they needed. You have others who will tell you, I was the only child at home in a single parent home. My mom had cancer, someone had to take care of her. State Superintendent of Schools John White says the department is making progress improving students' reading skills. Fourth grade is when students shift from learning to read to reading to learn. Actually, Louisiana, relative to most states, has made really good growth in fourth grade reading over the years, but Louisiana's ranking nationally is still not one of the higher states in fourth grade reading, not even close. And there's a lot behind that. Um, certainly there are challenges at home, there are challenges in communities that contribute to that, but part of it is, irrespective of those things, we as educators have to be as skilled as possible at early identification of learning needs and addressing those needs, especially when it comes to students being able to read. White says the state is using a variety of resources to do three things. First, we put into place a set of, of ways of measuring assessments, tests, that allow schools just to check up uh, from the time kids are four, five, six, seven years old, just a high quality look at number awareness, excuse me, letter awareness, at their ability to fluently read, and at their ability to actually comprehend as they get older the meaning of what it is that they're reading. Secondly, they're improving curricula. Curriculum can help teachers, especially in the early grades, uh, make sure that their kids are getting the exposure to all of those different skills that they need. And finally, then training teachers to use that curriculum and to intervene when students are really struggling. And the state is doing all of those things, and we're seeing growth in fourth grade literacy. No matter what your level of reading skill, literacy contributes to lifelong learning. John Cavalier owns and operates Cavalier House Books in Denham Springs, Louisiana. Reading is important no matter your age just because it expands your horizons. It's how we relate to each other. All stories are in books and all knowledge is in books. And so having that at your fingertips, it's the closest thing we have to being able to just put ourselves in someone else's shoes. Back at prime time, the Dudos and other children are reading the big orange splot. All the people would say, our street is us and we are it. Our street is where we like to be. It's about an eccentric homeowner who helped his neighbors better express themselves, thereby teaching the children about self-expression. That's what the power of reading can do. Before we get into our audience tonight and meet our audience members, I want to go over a few of the stats as it relates to reading in Louisiana. The most recent Annie Casey Foundation Kids Count report notes that 64% of the nation's fourth graders are not proficient in reading. In Louisiana, the percentage is 74%, actually an improvement from 2009. Students not reading at grade level by fourth grade are four times more likely to drop out of high school. A mother's reading level is one of the primary factors that determines a child's academic success. The national adult illiteracy rate is 15%. In Louisiana, 20% of adults are considered illiterate. Nationwide, of adults with the lowest literacy levels, 43% live in poverty and 70% of adult welfare recipients have low literacy levels. So those are some of the challenges that we're faced with here in Louisiana. Let's hear now from some of the efforts that are going on in our state. First, we wanna hear from Brandy. She's one of our second grade teachers of English language arts here in Louisiana. She's doing some exciting things in her classroom. Brandy. Yes, Sam. Um, in our schools, we are really encouraging students taking a choice in the books that they are reading every day. Um, when students um, have that choice in the books they are reading, whether it's in class or at home, then they really take an active role in the furthering their knowledge. So we have taken the, the stand of also giving them a choice in the pieces of writing that they are writing in our class because literacy no longer just encompasses reading, it's also writing. And we have these two final products that they will produce throughout the year where they get to publish a real book. And these kids, when they get to see their work bound like a real book you can buy in a store, the excitement, the smiles, and the jubilation that they show is unbelievable. I'm going to turn now to Denisa. She's one of our uh, literacy advocates. You're participating in the program here in Louisiana. Tell us a bit about your story and what even led you to getting to this point in your life. I went back um, to try and get my high set several times. Uh, and 
each time life happened. Um, it's just at work, things just happen. Um, but I always felt that I was not complete. And so my reason for going back at this time is just unfinished business. I have grandchildren that I'd like to um, pour and sow into, and I need to be able to give them the best of me. And with that, I can't lead by example if I'm not that example. And that's my reason for going back. Well, Denisa, we commend you for your courage to go back and certainly tie up that loose end, like you said, and have that complete in your life. And I'm gonna go with Missy. I'm loving your t-shirt, Missy. Dinosaurs didn't read, now they are extinct. Is that a coincidence? <laughs> I think not. <laughs> So, Missy, you have a bookstore. I do. Uh, Conundrum Books. Tell us a bit about the work that you're doing for literacy. We're in St. Francisville, Louisiana. And you think of a small town and how much can you do from that location. But what is wonderful about St. Francisville is it's a town that supports the arts so tremendously. We actually host three book festivals in St. Francisville, Louisiana that draw people from around the country. So we have the Walker Percy Weekend each June. We have um, the Writers and Readers Symposium that brings in authors from around the country in February and people, interested readers, to hear from these authors and to hear what goes into their writing. And then we started just two years ago the West Feliciana Children's Book Festival that is a children's book festival that's actually focused on the child. So instead of being focused at the teacher or at the librarian, this is for authors to come and communicate with the children themselves. And illustrators teach them to draw and writers read to them. It's a festival atmosphere to make reading fun from a very young age. And you know, all of us right here, we all think reading is fun. Everybody who's here tonight, <laughs> we're gonna, you know, one cheer for reading. And I wanna turn it over to Kim now. Kim's right next to you. And Kim, you're working specifically with African Americans and really enhancing reading and what goes on by providing literature that may not be able to be found everywhere. I have Between the Lines Bookstore. We're an on online bookseller. However, we do events here in the city as far as bringing prominent African-American authors here to Baton Rouge, as well as promoting the local African-American uh, self-published authors. So we do that through festivals, book events, and through partnerships like we just had with um, BRCC. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing as well. I'm gonna turn it over now to my other side here. And Jim, Louisiana Center for the Book. I'm excited because the book festival's coming and it comes every year and you haven't missed a year in 15 years. So tell us about the Louisiana Center for the Book and the Louisiana Book Festival. We already have over 250 authors scheduled. There'll be over 100 programs, programs for readers of all ages. Our byline is celebrating readers, writers, and books. And we have it in that order, order on purpose, readers mm -hmm. celebrated writers. first. Readers, readers writers, writers, and, and books. books. And uh, we're really looking forward to a lot of people coming to support us this year, uh, being our special 15th festival. We're gonna have special artwork we're anxious for you to see when the time comes. But the Center for the Book also does programs uh, throughout the year. We sponsor the Letters About Literature Writing Contest for grades four through 12. We have special programs to celebrate Black History Month the National Poetry Month. I'm gonna flip the script a little bit and we're gonna to go to Gerard, who's sitting right next to you. And Gerard, you have a, a different spin on this in terms of the economic impact of reading, particularly as you work with workforce development here at the Baton Rouge Community College. Tell us a bit about that. I think Lindy Boggs said it the best. Uh, it's not about literacy, it's about hope. And what, he, what she really meant about that, everything we do in workforce development is based on literacy skills. And there's a pure economic impact on that. The, the Louisiana information is still being developed, but there's a global study that was done in 2014. The U, in, the, in the U.S. is the $300 billion issue mm -hmm. or crisis. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you gave some great stats on what that means in Louisiana. So there's a huge multiplier between probably Louisiana and Texas on that. But when it really plays out is that those individual stories. So if Jim and I were welders, Welding is, is, a, is pretty much a, a theory-based practice, kind of mm -hmm. like playing a musician, just like a, being an artist. But if, I'm more, if I were functionally illiterate as a welder, and Jim was literate, I'm already at a 43% deficit of income that I'm bringing home to my family mm -hmm. and future growth. 
welding is something that is still hands-on, but even with the new technology of artificial intelligence, robots, and automation, you still need a function of welding, but there's new procedures that you still have to read on a daily basis. You can't go to and say, hey, Jim, I need you to tell me this procedure. Well, Jim's going to grow. He's going to grow on his field. I'm going to be left behind or be unemployed. So for us, it's, it's, it's fundamental that they, they have great literacy skills and comprehension skills with any craft that we do in workforce development. Mm -hmm. um, and safety is built around that. They've got to read the safety procedures and so forth. Also, you see how it plays out now. You know, 40, it's also 40%. 43% of poverty rate. So 43% just income change. Mm -hmm. And then a 43% of, of poverty is huge. So those are huge numbers that we have to deal with and grow. And, but it's also a great opportunity for workforce development uh, for us to, to tackle that issue um, so we all can move up. And like I said, it's really we're moving towards a future of two people. It's either those in the know, those in the know. And just because if I'm black and I'm white, but if I don't have literacy, I'm, I'm going to be the one uh, that's left behind. Amazing. Thank you, Gerard. That's a different perspective for us as we think about uh, the power of a reading is what we're celebrating this evening. And unfortunately, the, that's all the time that we have for this segment of our show. And we're going to return in just a moment with our panel of experts as we're going to continue to explore the power of reading. Welcome back to Louisiana Public Square, where tonight we're exploring literacy in Louisiana. We're here live at the Baton Rouge Community College in Baton Rouge, and I've got a great panel with us this evening to explore reading and the power of reading and literacy in Louisiana. First up, we've got Gary Robertson. He's the executive director of the Adult Literacy Advocates. Adult Literacy Advocates helps adults in the greater Baton Rouge area achieve personal employment and family goals by improving their literacy skills. Next, we have Rebecca Hamilton. She's a state librarian of Louisiana. Under her tenure, the amount of state aid to public libraries has doubled, and attendance to the Louisiana Book Festival has risen to 26,000. Danny Heitman has written a weekly column for the Advocate newspaper since 1991. His essays have appeared in national publications, and his book, A Summer of Birds, John James Audubon at Oakley House, was adapted into an LPB documentary. Miranda Restovich is president of the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities, the state affiliate to the National Endowment for the Humanities. She previously served as director of the LEH's award-winning and nationally implemented primetime family reading program. And last, we've got Linda Marie Barrett. She's Assistant Executive Director of the Southern Independent Booksellers Alliance, which represents thousands of booksellers, and SEBA unites individuals and businesses actively engaged in the writing, selling, publishing, distribution, and promoting of books throughout the South. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our panel. Thank you all for being here. So before we go to our audience questions, and we have uh, a number of audience questions, I'd like each of you just to take a moment very briefly and tell us what your primary role is or your organization's primary role in dealing with Louisiana's literacy challenges. And I'll start with you since you're right here, Lisa Marie. Right. Our organization represents independent bookstores in Louisiana and 10 states across the South. And for those of you who um, have a independent bookstore in your community, you know how vital that is to promoting the culture of reading because independent bookstores bring authors to the community, they bring authors to schools which can have a profound impact on children, um, and they also do outreach to underserved um, elements of the community. Some independent bookstores now are refurbishing vans and old school buses and bringing books out into places where there are no bookstores, maybe not even a branch of the library. So independent bookstores are a great partner to tap when um, confronting literacy challenges. Ms. Miranda. Great. Um, so um, I work with the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities. We're the statewide cultural and education agency associated with the National Endowment for the Humanities. And our work in literacy is pretty broad and deep and has been long-standing as long as we've been around since 1971. Um, first of all, I think we work really hard to partner with uh, folks like Jim at uh, the State Library to really promote and celebrate Louisiana's incredible literary heritage. Um, and we do have 
an incredible heritage to celebrate and make our uh, populations and everybody around the world really proud of. Um, and then secondly, I think our organization has also been addressing uh, the real issue of intergenerational illiteracy since uh, we, we sort of figured out that it was a really big problem and for us that started in 1991. And we as an organization have had a sustained um, investment in working with families mostly um, to really start very young and start in the lap uh, to inspire families to read together, to think th together, to uh, learn together, and to really make literacy and reading and learning part of um, a family tradition, um, and also connecting those families to our incredible system of state libraries, which is a free resource in every parish, um, as well as putting books right in the homes of, of families. So we're really proud of that work, and that work has um, been exported. Um, it's hard to believe, but Louisiana is exporting an incredible literacy program that is prime time, and we're really proud of that as well. So. Danny, we, we read, it, read you regularly in The Advocate. Tell us a bit more about that. Thank you, Robin. Uh, I've uh, worked at The Advocate for more than three decades now. Like uh, any newspaper, uh, we depend on readers to stay in business, and if we don't have readers, then I don't have a job. So this topic is very close to my heart. Uh, at The Advocate, we have uh, worked many years to try to promote the value of uh, elementary and secondary education, which is the gateway to reading for most people. We have tried to support higher education, which is a way for our citizens to deepen their appreciation of reading. We try to uh, hold and lift up uh, our uh, adult literacy programs that help those who have been left behind on the path to literacy. Uh, and through our culture pages and our culture coverage, we also try to promote the idea of reading as something that is fun because I think if we can learn to enjoy something, that gives us a sustained engagement with it. So uh, every day, 365 days a year, uh, we try to provide compelling content on multiple platforms at our newspaper so that we can be a meeting place every day for Louisiana's uh, readers. Rebecca Hamilton, Chief Librarian, State of Louisiana. Well, at the State Library, we like to say that everything that we do builds a culture of literacy in Louisiana. We do that through our 340 public libraries that have deep, uh, meaningful relationships with all of the entities within their communities for uh, things that aren't just regular library things, but the things that we're talking about here today, like early literacy. We, we do that through the public libraries, but we also do it through the things that we do, like the Louisiana Book Festival. Um, which is really one of the best book festivals in the world. Everything we do, we think about what is it that our citizens need? What is it that we need to do to help prepare them for the future? So we have a lot of things with our talking books and braille library where we do literacy programs for um, children with, who are blind or, or low vision. Um, we do things with our, our prisons, trying to make sure our prisoners can do research and get reading materials and training. So really everything we do at the State Library is infused down really through our, our biggest partners, which are our 340 public libraries. So Gary, we got a chance to get a peek at uh, who you are in the okay. earlier segment of the show, but yes. let's bring it more live to us. I think our agency, along with many other nonprofits and state agencies and uh, faith-based organizations or in a sense on the front line at working with people who have literacy issues, trying to improve the rate of literacy in the state. We work with students who, if they're not able to read at all, we help them learn how. If they're already able to read and need to improve their skills, we work with them there if they need help to move on towards passing their high set exam, which is the new GED, mm -hmm. to get their equivalency diploma, we help them there. So we try to reach out wherever we can help our students to make that progress that they need to achieve those goals that, that will help them um, contribute to the community and just make their lives richer. So now we're gonna hear from our 
audience panel. We have two students who represent the Louisiana Youth Advisory Council, and they're here this evening. And I'm gonna start with you all because you probably read more than anybody in here because you're still in high school. <laughs> so lots of reading takes place there. And Relina, I'm gonna start with you and your question to the panel. My name is Relina Ramrakiani. I'm a representative of the Louisiana Legislative Youth Advisory Council. My question is open to all panelists. Looking at the list, what books were you surprised made the list and what books were you surprised did not make it? Follow up question, do you think that the books that made the list are indicative of where literature is heading? And she's speaking of the 100 books uh, that the Great American Read selected. So I think some of you are familiar with those are the more popular books across uh, the spectrum of, Louis um, I say Louisiana, but spectrum of American reading. I think the uh, goal of any list like this is to begin a discussion, not to end one. And I think it's great that we can have a debate about what was on the list and what wasn't. I uh, have always looked to John Updike as one of my great literary heroes, and I was disappointed that none of his books were on the list. But at the same time, I was heartened to see uh, To Kill a Mockingbird on the list because that's a book that I hold close to my heart, as do so many people. I think the way that uh, Harper Lee was able to simulate in words the way that uh, a child sees the world is just a marvelous accomplishment. And so um, there were things on the list that pleased me and things on the list that disappointed me, but I think that is the great thing about reading is that it gets us thinking and it gets us talking. We have a lot of lists at the State Library. We do the Young Summer uh, Reading Program book list and Young Reader's Choice. But I'm with Danny on that one. I keep thinking about To Kill a Mockingbird and how um, everybody relates to that book. Because uh, I think I was Scout. I've, uh, you know, I've always re related well to that book. But the key, I think, is to talk about literature and to make those lists. We've had situations at the State Library where we're compiling a list for, say, the Young Reader's Choice. And you can hear the debate going on. I don't think this one should be on there. I think this one should. And that's a great thing to hear, um, you know, whether you agree with what's on the list or not. It's, a, it's an important thing to talk about literature and think about literature and what literature does, um, the, the impact that it has on especially a young person. Um, every young person I know I've recommended To Kill a Mockingbird to, and everybody sees it a little bit different and picks something really important out of it. So um, I'm, I'm all about a list of books. We've got an author in our audience tonight, and I, I really wanted you to be able to respond to that in, in your own way or sure. pose another question even if you will. So you're going to do both sides of this. Fantastic. Uh, Kent, <laughs> Kent is an author. He's a young author, 32 years old. But you've already got three huge books behind your name. Thank you. Uh, medium books for the readers out there. <laughs> it might be too daunting, but um, I think, Rolani, there's a wonderful question. Um, and to everyone on the panel's point, um, and from the writer's perspective, the kinds of lists start to get really competitive <laughs> and dodgy. But they do start that conversation, and moreover, like how heartening it is to watch a country talk about books <laughs> instead of a lot of the other things we've been mm. discussing lately. Mm -hmm. um, but from my pick, I was unbelievably heartened to see um, 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez uh, on that list. That's a book that's deeply meaningful to me. And I noted a couple of the panelists were talking about To Kill a Mockingbird being really important um, to them. But I would put to the rest of y'all, and since we're going out to an audience and an audience of readers and potential readers, what is there a transformative book for you, a book that set you on that path of loving literature? Well, when you're talking about a transformative book, um, I was really blessed to have a bookmobile come to my neighborhood because my mother couldn't drive. So every Thursday we would go to the bookmobile and the bookmobile lady had a huge influence on me because she would select books for me. And the book that started me on the path of reading, I think, was um, The Chronicles of Narnia, which is mm -hmm. on the list. Mm -hmm. um, Wrinkle, of Wrinkle in Time is not on the list. That was also huge for me, but um, it really hooked me into books about magical experiences, and I remember running through the fields hoping that I would just, you know, go into <laughs> Narnia somehow. I love the breadth and variety of the mm -hmm. list because 
sometimes you can get judgmental, you know, kind of snobbish about books, and you never know, as a former bookseller, I was surprised sometimes by the books that would change people's lives. And sometimes for me as a reader, I'm reading something and it's a lighter book, but it contains this sentence that's like life-changing for me. So um, I know that there are some more commercial titles on the list, and, mm -hmm. but I think that just shows that our tastes are very broad as a country, and I think that's a good thing. Gary, uh, a little bird told me that you had a book that uh, transformed your life as a, as a young person. I, I know it's not on the list. It that's was okay. a book called Follow My Leader, a guy named James Garfield. And it was one of those scholastic books that was published for kids. I remember reading it fourth or fifth grade. But what I remember most about it, it's not just the reading it, but the rereading of it. I'd always enjoyed reading up to that point, but that book made me love reading. I would have to say that um, Confederacy of Dunces is probably the book that um, changed m my view of my new environment. I moved to, the, to New Orleans when I was 11 from a different country. And I just remember landing there and feeling like I just landed on Mars. <laughs> sort of the, the definition of culture shock uh, was happening in full force. And once I learned the language and really started immersing myself in books and had an incredible teacher who just fed me books, I stumbled across a confederacy of dunces. And I just remember after I read it, I fell in love with my new home in a way that I don't think would have happened had I not encountered that silly character and wanted to retrace his steps. <laughs> um, and then I would say the second book was, um, much later in life, I read An Accidental City by Larry Powell, which also is about New Orleans and a pretty deep history of the founding of the city and very well researched and gave me a very different perspective of the new place that I called home. So we've been talking about the power of reading and uh, we've been talking a little bit about the power of books. I want to talk a bit more about a clip that we're going to take a moment to look at, and that's from the PBS series, The Great American Read. I was in junior high school when I checked out To Kill a Mockingbird from the library. I had a deep appreciation for that sense of curiosity that we see in Scout. And then I read it again in high school, and I began to identify with the accused, Tom Robinson, because I was old enough to see friends and acquaintances be targeted by our criminal justice system, I had to begin worrying about what a false accusation could do. For me, being a lawyer was becoming someone who would be willing to stand when other people said, sit down. One of my clients is a modern day Tom Robinson. Anthony Ray Hinton was wrongly accused of two murders in Birmingham, Alabama. He was convicted because he was poor and didn't have the money to defend himself. When the judge said, I sentence you to death, it was as though all of the fibers that connect to make me live just died. I had wrote Mr. Stevenson from death row, and the moment I shake this man's hand, I have no doubt in my mind that God had sent me his best. It took 16 years, but Stevenson's argument ultimately convinced the Supreme Court to overturn Anthony Ray Hinton's sentence. They want my freedom. The justice system need more people like that. It's a beautiful book. It tells an important story. Read it, talk about it, think about it, and then do something to make the world a less unjust place. Not everyone has a formal role in addressing Louisiana's challenges as it relates to literacy, but what do you think that our viewers and, and those who are here with us tonight could do in their respective realms to address this challenge? I think one of the operative sentences from To Kill a Mockingbird for me is whenever the young scout says of her father, all he did was sit in the living room and read. She's kind of done with her father because she thinks that his reading life is a form of inaction. And really his reading life is what inspires him and drives him to do the sort of work that he does. And so I think the first thing for us to remember is that reading is not a passive act. It is a way for us to engage with a larger community. It is, a, it is a way for us to engage with ourselves. So that's the first thing. 
And I think every citizen, regardless of their role, if you are a reader, then lift it up. Talk about reading with the same passion with which you talk about politics, with which you talk about sports, with which you talk about all of your other pastimes. And in lifting reading up and talking about it, you will inspire a larger community conversation. And also, everyone can volunteer. They can volunteer to be a reading mentor. They can volunteer in their schools. They can volunteer in their churches and libraries to expand the circle of readers in Louisiana, which we desperately need. Our volunteers at the Book Festival want to come back every year. Mm -hmm. They want the same spot, doing the same job. They're, they're committed. But I've heard throughout my life, um, other people tell me the greatest gift someone did for me was bring me to the public library. There are people that don't know what public libraries have and what they do. And if you see someone struggling with reading or access to information and books, um, bring them to the library, show them how to use the library. There's a statistic that I always mention when Katrina and Rita happened and all of our citizens moved up into the state, um, two thirds of our libraries were closed. So everybody moved up to use those northern libraries. Library usage was only down 1% with two thirds of our libraries closed. So everyone, I think it's embedded in our psyche that libraries are safe. Even people that didn't know what they did or what they could get, they, you know, they learned pretty quickly and those libraries had these great reciprocal agreements to let anybody do check out books or whatever. But I think I'm always shocked when people don't know East Baton Rouge Parish here has one of the best libraries in the country. Uh, the best resources, the best engaged, loving staff that want to help. We have a librarian in the audience tonight, and I, I want to give her a chance to ask a question. She's right here at her home library, right down the, right down the hallway at BRCC. Jacqueline, <laughs> would you share with us? I'm Jacqueline L. Jones, currently serving as interim dean of the library here at Baton Rouge Community College. I have a question. You sort of kind of taking my thunderball, uh, which are some of your responses, but the community college, Baton Rouge Community College, can be seen as the new kid on the block as it relates to higher education in the city of Baton Rouge. We have a Research One, and we have a large HBCU. And BRCC being only 20 years old this August, I'd like to ask the audience what role or how can the community college play a role in impacting literacy in our Baton Rouge area, given the fact that one of the goals of a community college is to afford educational opportunities that may not be afforded at a four-year institution like LSU or at Southern. So what role or what impact can this community college make on literacy in Baton Rouge? Well, I can tell you right now one impact that VRCC has made with us is we are in a partnership with y'all currently and with some of your students who may need our services and our help, you refer them to us. Um, we work with y'all with your programs to kind of help our students track into that. So we try to work collaboratively with, collaborative with, with you so that we can help each other to reach those students who need to be helped and bring forth the, the best assets that we both have to help the students. And I'd like to say that I think you have some of the best students. Everyone we've interacted with at the State Library, on the staff and on the student body, have been fantastic, uh, intelligent, engaged, bright, wanting to help. And I can think of, Jackie, so many ways where your students could partner with us because, you know, we're critically short-staffed because of state funding cuts, budget cuts. Um, down 50% in some cases, m money and staff. Um, as we go out into the communities across the state, as sort of, a, I always say deploy, we deploy out into the state to help those areas that may, in some, some parishes, Tinsaw, Union, Caldwell, those poor rural parishes that don't have the resources that maybe some of the larger parishes have. So a co-training opportunities on these things and then just building a workforce to go out and help those libraries that struggle. Thank you, Jackie, for that question. I'm going to turn to this side of our, our audience panel and our, our other student, Spencer, representing the Le Legislative Youth Advisory Council. What's your question this evening? Hello, I'm Spencer Heitman, representing the Legislative Youth Advisory Council, and this question can go out to anyone who feels so compelled to answer. It also deals with the Great American Read List that we discussed briefly earlier, and that is that on that list we see an extraordinarily broad range of novels with everything from 
dense literary fiction like that of Dostoevsky all the way to contemporary erotica like Fifty Shades of Grey. So in what ways do you think that such disparate uh, works of art can have positive social impacts and how do you think that they can be unified through their social implications? Thank you. Amazing question from some of our young <laughs> audience <laughs> members. <laughs> so, one thing that libraries do really well, I think, uh, not to constantly talk about libraries, but the whole idea of building a collection that represents all points of view. Um, our job is to provide information that could, uh, you know, that anybody could want, not just one point of view. And I think that that's really important because the more points of view that are out there, the more um, opinions that are represented, I think it opens the dialogue for people to understand each other better and maybe not have this idea or shatter an idea that you had about a people, a place, or a thing, or something like that. But public libraries are, are really at the, the root of that, the foundation of that. Because we, you know, there have been many times where I've bought a book and thought, I really hate this book. I don't agree with this book at all. It has to be here. It has to be represented to the people. I think any time you are brought into the presence of a, of a book, you're in the presence of a voice that requires you to listen to it for an extended length of time. And I think just that exercise cannot help but build tolerance in our world, and we desperately need it. I would just add that I think, um, you know, many books that we see today as sort of classics were contemporary at some point and maybe even extremely controversial. Um, and so I think it's important that we continue to build um, into the, you know, in, into the pool of potential future classics by really incorporating what is popular or what, what people are reading today. And if that is Fifty Shades of Grey, then it belongs on the list as much as Dostoevsky. I was thinking that Fifty Shades of Grey could be like a gateway drug to Pride and Prejudice. You know, like, right. if, if That's some, a thought. yeah, you just never know, like, that might be. It's a thought. <laughs> for some people, and bookstores and libraries, I'm sure, are very clever about um, how they can take Fifty Shades of Grey and then put something like Pride and Prejudice or put other, other books around it, and then someone will try that, and then they might try something else that might have a little bit more literary depth. But I do agree with what you were saying, that just the act of reading is, is a great exercise for your mind. And you never know what the book, that book might turn you on to something that might have more weight later. So John Cavalier is a, a member of our audience this evening, and he's a bookseller. So I know you've been burning with some thoughts over there. Please share your question with the panel. We have a brick and mortar bookstore in Denham Springs, and we also do uh, several book fairs throughout the year in schools and what we come across all the time are families obviously getting excited about books. Um, from time to time we also come across kids that are getting excited about books but parents that maybe mm -hmm. don't share that same love. Uh, what I'm curious about is what's some practical advice that I could kind of take away to encourage um, the, the families of these young kids, especially uh, adults that may not have fundamental literacy skills um, to pass along. I think one of the things you can always tell adults, and I tell this to our students um, who come, come to our, into our program, is that it's never too late. Reading is one of those things, it's, there's, it's never too late to get started and to develop your skills at it and to particularly impress upon parents how much their reading and their interest and in their encouragement of that impacts their children. And we do have you know, several of our students who have taken books out from our, our library and to read to their, to their children, to work, to you know, go over with them. Um, and one of the things they'll be most excited about is they'll come in and say, I was able to you know, help my kids with their homework last night or read with them. And I think just encouraging them to do that and understanding the impact it has on them as they go down the line. Because I think we all can remember, especially those of us who are avid readers now, that example that we saw from our families or parents or grandparents who always read. I think that's a, a prime thing that they can do. 
So Miranda, I understand primetime reading, you have the program where you allow everyone to take the books home, mm -hmm. spend some time with them, kind of shed some light in response to, to uh, this question. I love that question. That question <laughs> is so uh, at the heart of what we do in primetime. Louisiana is facing uh, a challenge where we, in order to break the cycle of intergenerational illiteracy, we have to start somewhere. Um, and I think all the strategies to tackle adult versus children, all of them together, all of it um, helps solve the problem in some way. But I think to your point, I think children's books are an amazing place to start with families. Um, and I think starting wherever they are um, and introducing them to a really fabulous picture book is a great way to get the family gathered around the table um, where the parent maybe doesn't feel so intimidated. There's not too many words on a page, but they can tell the story by looking at great illustrations. Um, or picking up from a child's interest in books and really encouraging the family to let the child lead the reading and the discussion versus the parent. I think the, the role that we often think, like parent has to be there to read to the child at night, isn't necessarily so if the child is um, a great reader, but the parent is not, having the child read to the parent can be just as powerful. So I think, um, you know, guiding them to books that are accessible, um, still quality, but accessible and have lots of great stories to tell, and then encouraging the family to do it in the way that is comfortable to them, I think is a, um, is a really awesome thing. And I've often um, gone into bookstores and, you know, also watching family dynamics and seeing, um, you know, really allowing them to gravitate towards the books that they love instead of telling them what books they should be reading is a great way. And that's why I love observing families in bookstores because you can always see where, you know, where the child is really going, um, going or where the mom or dad or grandma might be going. So I think you have a unique opportunity to really curate that experience for families because you're right there and you can really watch body language and what's happening. Ellen? I know we haven't heard from you this evening on your question. As the representative of the Louisiana Reading Association, we're a professional organization and our mission is to increase the quality of literacy for all, all ages. So our main target audience are teachers, obviously, and so we try to provide opportunities, whether it be the Young Authors Writing Contest or even educators as authors, we have opportunities for family and community reads. But tonight I'm hearing all these different opportunities. Is there a database anywhere or is there somewhere that teachers can go to and find out about all these things? Because some of these things I've never heard before. And so if we could have some type of database for teachers that have all these opportunities for them to share either with their families or their students, I think that would be very beneficial. So libraries very often cull resources and pull them together in one place. And so probably your East Baton Rouge Parish Library, certainly the State Library, um, we have electronic databases where you can type in a subject, heading, literacy, early literacy, high, low, books, things like that. And it will show you, you know, a lot of things. Um, probably there's no one place for with everything, but I think certainly your public library, the state library, and you can do that with your library card. There are resources out there that aren't necessarily vetted by librarians, but that are still really good. Um, I call them kind of mom and pop things that somebody saw an opening or a hole of uh, that where information wasn't available and they created it. And um, sometimes that stuff is really, really good. So I would just use the web as your as your best resource invaluable resources for us and our organization. One are the libraries, okay, as Rick said. We also use the advocate, the local mm -hmm. newspaper. That's true. And it is amazing, especially when you're dealing with adults and the different skills that they need, it's amazing how many you can draw from the newspaper. I mean, from something as simple as alphabetizing, like looking at the sections of the paper, to being able to look for main ideas, and the list just goes on and on. We're continually finding new ways to use the newspapers, and we're grateful to the advocate for helping us out with that. And public libraries very often have those newspapers on microfilm, 
or back issues because uh, I know what we do is sometimes when we research something we'll find a small homegrown group doing something fabulous that maybe was in the paper there's an article in the small little rural northern Louisiana paper and it didn't go very far but then you find it and you go and you see what they're doing and they may be a best practice for something that just never got a lot of attention so definitely look at the at the back issues of newspapers too so we're going to go down the line for closing comments if you will and Gary I'll start with you the problem of literacy in Louisiana is great but I think it's also solvable and one of the things that makes a big difference, and it's a word that everyone I think has mentioned tonight, it's that V word, volunteer. We depend on volunteers tremendously. We have volunteers from all walks of life who just want to help out our students. And they may just come in and work as a classroom assistant, or they may work one-to-one -one as a tutor with a student who can't make it to our classes because of their work schedule or family obligations so find a way to volunteer and do something to help bring that love that you have for books and reading to someone else i'd like to say never underestimate the power of human connection and interaction um, and literature i can think of two moments in my career where the library the prime time reading time program the combination of my staff or, or what we did really changed someone's life. There was a little boy, I did prime time Miranda in, I want to say it was 1996 in St. Mary Parish. And this little boy and his mom, they were not library users, had never been in the library. And he was literally holding on to the door when they were trying to get him in the library. He did not want to come. We didn't look like him. He had never seen this place. There were all these books. He just wasn't sure. And um, I bought a puppet and a puppet that looked like him. And I would get down at his level and I would talk to him with that puppet. And he interacted with that puppet in a way that made him feel safe and comfortable. And they became, they, they went through the whole program, they were successful, and I think I, because I made great friends down in St. Mary, and I went back maybe 10 years later, and um, he, I, this young man in the grocery store said, do you remember me? And I could look at his face and knew I knew it, uh, could remember him. But when, we, when he, we changed the way he saw the library, he would run in and press his little face against my, my glass office and say, I'm here, like we can start now. But he became a lot, so he was a young man later when I saw him. And he had become a library, a strong library user. And he changed his mom's life because she was not a library user. So that prime time, you know, just changed everything for them. But he remembered me and he remembered that puppet. So that was a connection that we made that he never forgot. Mm -hmm. And he always said, when I was with babysit cousins and nieces and nephews, he's like, I would, I would try to use a puppet. I remembered what it meant. And so that, that human connection that we make over helping somebody, especially something as you know, personal and uh, you know, important as being able to read to be successful. I think the fundamental uh, and just marvelous mystery of reading is that it's an act that is done in solitude and yet it connects us with a community as wide as the world. And, it's, and just being in, that, in this community of readers tonight reminds me how fortunate we all are to belong to that community and it's really incumbent on all of us to enlarge that community, to enlarge Louisiana's community of readers across the state. Oh, I would say that um, I think it's really important that we um, support our, our public institutions that are there to democratize access uh, to reading and literacy and learning and education, like our incredible system of public libraries and our public schools. Um, those educators are on the front lines and uh, they should be resourced and supported in every community. And I would also say that starting early is extremely important. Uh, that's why we, you know, we invest in primetime programs that start with as families with children three and up because we think that starting as early as possible, as, as soon as the child recognizes a book and can flip a page is extremely important and can really hopefully put you out of business at some point yes. so that we're not having to catch up later. Those are the things that, that can make a big difference in our state and really help us overcome this quite challenging uh, issue that we have continued to chip away at but not make significant 
uh, gains on. Um, and, and I think we can't do it if we don't support the public enterprise of the whole thing. I just have to make a pitch again for independent bookstores and to remember them um, because they fill a lot of gaps that public services can't through hard work and big heartedness. They're often d giving away free books to uh, prisoners, to, to kids who don't have money to buy books. Um, they're doing whatever they can to help connect readers with books. So I really urge you, especially in this time when there's a lot of online competition, to remember this very, very valuable resource in your community. Um, some people call it, you know, it's like the living room of your community and it needs your support. It'll help all these other organizations do the hard work. I want to thank our panelists tonight, Gary Robertson, Rebecca Hamilton, Danny Heitman. Definitely want to thank you, Miranda Ristovich. Thank you. And of course, Linda Marie Barrett. We, we got to thank um, our discussion audience. Thank you all. Give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you for being here this evening. And definitely want to thank our theater audience as well, those of you who are out there watching and enjoying this. And a huge thanks to the Baton Rouge Community College and all the work that they've done in hosting us this evening. We want to thank you for that. And of course, those at the Magnolia Theater right here at the Baton Rouge Community College. So I want to remind everyone as you're sitting here this evening that we will uh, be airing The Great American Read. The PBS series will come out September the 11th, and that's going to be at 7 p.m. You can catch that on LPB across the state of Louisiana. We're glad again that you're here. Round of applause for everyone on stage. Thank you. A round of applause, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. And that is all for us. And we're wishing you a very good evening. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org. Major production funding provided by Anne Ray Foundation, a Margaret A. Cargill philanthropy, engagement funding provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and Anne Ray Foundation, a Margaret A. Cargill philanthropy, and by... Support for LPB comes from Community Coffee Company and the Community Cash for Schools program, helping schools across the state earn funds for over 25 years. Registration information at communitycoffee.com. Support provided by the men and women of the Louisiana Forestry Association. For sustainability, LFA members work to promote the health and productivity of Louisiana's forests for generations to come. And by LSU Press. Featuring Margaret Stone's Native Flora of Louisiana Folio, limited edition, and these fine titles. Information at lsupress.org. And by these independent booksellers of Louisiana. With the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and viewers like you.